Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, for some reason, I'm having some technical difficulties this morning. My computer is being slow, so hopefully everything is working okay uh, and transmitting okay to you all. Uh, welcome, everybody, to Wiggle Wednesday. Uh, just me today. Steve's still in Dallas. He says hi. He's in training for his uh, pilot stuff for Southwest Airlines. But uh, I'll talk for just a few minutes here. We'll try and get a few more people on. Uh, I've got some people from Missouri. Alberta, Canada, Los Angeles, New Orleans, ooh, Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome, welcome. Um, just to, let's see here. Steve had wanted me to mention, um, we've got the eco bag that's out and he's been working on some new designs. Let me see if I can bring this up on my phone. He was gonna put up something for pre-order and uh, there was kind of a cool one here. I'll show you I'll, if I can get it on the camera. So it's like a camouflage worm face. That's kind of cool that's going to be coming up. And he sent me one with some mushrooms, uh, some neat designs that are coming up here. Anyway, uh, let's see here. We've got somebody from Eastern Kansas, another somebody else from Canada. So today we're going to be talking about worm anatomy. Um, I'm going to be going through the different exterior or interior parts of a worm, mainly focusing on red wigglers and lambricidae uh, as much as possible. And uh, pretty much just sticking with the physical stuff, I'll go through some of like what they do like with reproduction and things, but uh, that was a whole different episode. So uh, mainly just going through like the physical parts of the worm inside and out. So let me go ahead and bring up my presentation here and I will stop these banners so they are not in the way. Hold on one second here. Come on. All right, let me click this up here. Cool, so it's uh, last, day, last day of November, three weeks until winter starts. Uh, today we're gonna to be talking about worm anatomy. So first I'm gonna go over the exterior parts of the worm, then we'll go in over the interior parts and then through some of their systems like the vascular system, respiratory system, uh, not the excretory system. I'll t talk a little about that uh, in other parts. And then the nervous system and the reproductive system. I had updated that, but I guess it didn't take the excretory system out after I uploaded it to this. Anyway, moving on here to the exterior. So let me make this larger real quick so I can see it better while I'm talking to you all. And of course my computer isn't responding. So on the outside, I'm going to flip back and forth between uh, this page and the next page because this was a large drawing that I didn't want to have to squeeze into this page so that you could see it better. So uh, the main thing about worms that I'm sure everyone has noticed is that they have segments. So they're segmented individuals. Let me see my pointer here. It shows the segments. Each of these little rings is a segment on the worm. And for red wigglers, they average about 108 segments. Um, for any type of worm, uh, aquatic or land uh, or terrestrial, um, the number of segments are used for identification and different things uh, are layouts of parts that are on those segments are used for identification of worms. Um, and then along with the segments are the grooves between the segments. So each segment is numbered from the mouth to the tail end with the first one where the mouth is being number one, two, three, four, obviously on the way, all the way up to the tail end where you've got the larger 108, 110, whatever you're getting up to. And then there are grooves between the segments that uh, in on the interior, which I'll show you, let's see, I'll, I'll see if I can flip it ahead here. Uh, so these on the very right-hand side here, it shows the septum and the plural of that is septa. So you can see on the outside here, it shows 15, 14, 15. So between those segments, the uh, grooves line up with the, seg with the septa inside their bodies. Um, and they are numbered by the uh, segment on each side. So nine to 10 would be the one between nine and 10, 10 to 11 would be the one between 10 and 11 uh, all the way up. And then, uh, the other one other main feature starting with their mouth is that they have a I'm going to flip it ahead here again. They have a peristomium, which makes up the first section here. 
And part of that is the prostomium. And I thought I had brought my book up here with me, but I did not bring that. So um, you've got the mouth part, like here's the mouth opening. And then there's a flap that comes down over top of that, uh, that flaps up and out like this. And that's what's called the prostomium. And you can kind of see it there jutting out in this photo. Um, other than that, we've got setae, which are bristle-like uh, hairs that run all along the worm there. Um, so with Lumbricidae, there are eight, uh, eight setae on each segment. So they run around the periphery of the segment. Um, this, I just kind of put in an example of what they may look like. They're normally paired up like this, and they're going to be uh, either somewhat close together like that, or maybe even a little bit wider but they uh, are generally come in pairs like that. And for, like I said, uh, Lumbricidae, which the red wigglers are part of that family, I believe it's family, um, have uh, eight of these, so four pairs. Um, the setae are, can be different shapes, um, either needle-like, hook-like, uh, hair-like, uh, they're mainly used for movement. So the locomotory movement of a worm as it moves across uh, whatever uh, substrate, it's going to be using those setae to move along. Other than that, it uses them for reproduction. So uh, especially in red wigglers, they have uh, special ones that grab onto their partner to hold them better. And then in some lumbricidae, there are even uh, certain setae that are, that are made for reproduction and they uh, offer physical stimulation to their partner. So, uh, they're mainly used for movement though, and then some are used for reproduction. And then what's really cool about them is that these setae can extend or retract uh, through their muscles that are inside here. Uh, so they can come out farther through the skin or even retract uh, partially into the skin. And then let's see here. So it shows the setae right here. You can see these tiny little hairs, looks like whiskers on this picture, uh, like, a, like a beard whiskers or whatever. Uh, other than that, uh, we've got the clitellum. So let me fast forward real quick here. So I think most of you are familiar. If you don't know the name, you're at least familiar with the part. So that's that wide band that once a worm reaches sexual maturity, they're going to have this clitellum. That is a segment that is even wider than normal. And uh, it's normally bulging or puffed up. Uh, and then they are saddle shaped or they go around almost the entire uh, ring of the worm. So in red wigglers, they're generally on the 25th, uh, or they're on the 25th or 26th segment. That is one way to identify that people use uh, identification of red wigglers. Um, and again, the clitellum on any worm, the position of it, uh, as, as far as where it is, uh, segment wise on any worm is used for identification. So also on the exterior worm, We've got segments, we've got the mouth parts, we've got setae, we've got clitellum, then we've got the reproductive openings. Uh, and we'll be getting into this a little bit more in the reproductive system, uh, but just kind of talking about the parts that are on the exterior of the worm here. So we've got a, a female reproductive opening that is on the 14th segment and a male reproductive opening that is on the 15th segment. Along with that, there are gonna be things that are tiny little pores that you're not gonna be able to see called nephridiopores. And I think that uh, I didn't even know this one until I was reading up on this uh, in the past couple of weeks here. Uh, it's a extra, so the excretory organ openings uh, uh, are the, they, uh, sorry, they are excretory organ openings. So they're along the lateral side of the worm. So on each side, there's a pair for each segment. One goes to this side, one goes to this side, and they excrete uh, nitrogenous materials. So that would be like uh, urine type thing. So they're actually urinating through their skin as well as breathing through their skin. So uh, fun, fun fact to remember when you're handling your worms there that you're getting a bunch of pee on you. Uh, and then lastly, you've got the pigmentation. So worms are different colors due to pigmentation or a lack of pigmentation. So uh, when you see white worms like pot worms, they actually don't have any pigmentation and that's why you're seeing that color. So as far as red wigglers, the red coloring comes from granules. I need to take a drink real quick. 
comes from granules or pigment cells that are below the uh, skin surface there. And in red wigglers, the reason that we have uh, varied colors or those rings of colors are because these pigments aren't evenly distributed in the worm. So you're seeing, um, seeing through the skin of the worm and seeing these pigmented cells that uh, have more or less pigments in them. And that's why it is different colors. And then when you see a yellow color in worms, that's generally coming from the salomic fluid. Uh, if you've heard of the salomic fluid before, that's that milky, whitish, yellowish uh, fluid that worms can excrete, uh, which we'll be discussing in a few moments here. Uh, but they release that um, under stress or when they're, uh, we'll get to it in a second here, but mainly as a, in response to stress. Uh, so uh, the yellow tip of the tail of a worm is likely from that salomic fluid that you're seeing that color come through the uh, epidermis of their skin. So let's see here. Is there anything else I wanted to talk about with this? No, we've got setae, prostomium, segments, and clitellum. So um, other than this, we'll move on to the interior of the worm. Uh, and again, I forgot to mention that if you do have questions, uh, I'm not going to be able to see any of your comments until I'm done with the presentation. So I'll answer any questions that come up as soon as I get done with the presentation here. Plus, we'll have the Q&A section at the end. So just to make you aware that I'm not going to be able to see any questions. Uh, so moving on from the exterior, we've got the interior parts now. Uh, this is just a uh, drawing that I came up with uh, to kind of show you the different three main parts of the interior of the worm. So uh, on the very exterior, we have what's called the body wall. And that's going to be made up of the outer cuticle, the epidermis. So we have both of those on our skin. It's just that outer shell that you have. Uh, that's followed up by nerve tissue. And then you've got muscle tissue. And then what's called the peritoneum layer, which uh, is a layer that separates each uh, the body wall from the coelom and the coelom from the alimentary canal. Um, so that's just a kind of a special layer that keep parts from uh, colliding with each other or, or touching up against each other. So that's the body wall. That's going to be a very thin layer of, uh, just like we have a very thin layer of skin, that's going to be a very thin layer on the outside of the worm. And next up is their coelom, which is filled with the salemic fluid. Um, if you've ever experienced them releasing the salemic fluid, uh, it's a with red wigglers or Asenia fetida, it smells of garlic or it has a foul smell. And that's actually how uh, they get the, the name fetida. Fetida is Latin. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's Latin, not Greek, but Latin for uh, foul smelling or stinky. And, and that's why they got their name is because they released this stinky salomic fluid. Um, so the salomic fluid, they eject in response to chemical or mechanical irritation. So uh, if you were to harm them in some way while you're handling them, they may release some of the salomic fluid or um, people who have had their worm bins go anaerobic um, because of the chemical reactions in there with the anaerobicity. Uh, you've got acids being built up and the worms can't handle that. And so they'll, you'll see a bunch of worms with this yellow fluid come out that they've uh, released in response to that chemical irritation. Um, so that's what's happening if you ever see that, if you ever see that uh, milky, yellowish, whitish fluid coming out of your worms is something, something's going on there that they cannot handle it. So that's the, the middle section here. Uh, then once we get into the very center, that's going to be called the alimentary canal. And that's basically a tube that runs from end to end. Um, and I wish I had a better drawing. I wasn't able to find a, a real good drawing that wasn't too crowded up with a bunch of uh, terms in it. Uh, but basically, if we were to start off, let's see here, I'm going to use this pen. Uh, so if this pen was a worm, we've got the mouth section, which is the buccal cavity, which makes up the mouth where they're chewing away, bringing stuff into their system. Behind the buccal cavity is a small cavity called the pharynx. I'm sure you all have heard this term in high school biology or other biology classes. So the pharynx is going to work as a pump 
pulling things from the mouth or buccal cavity uh, and uh, making pumping action and pulling it into the esophagus and pushing that into the crop. So just like we have an esophagus that moves down to our intestines and uh, digestive organs, uh, they've got the pharynx that's pumping food material through the esophagus to the crop. The crop uh, is going to be, uh, you know, again, this is in the first like three, one third of the section of the worm. So you've got the crop that's basically storage for food material until it can go into the gizzard. And then the gizzard is where it works as a grinder. Uh, worms don't have teeth like mammals do. So uh, like chickens, they rely on the crop and the gizzard to um, make this material ground up to where they can digest it and get nutrients and minerals, acquire nutrients and minerals from it. So um, this is why they need the gritty material in their food every so often. Um, if you're feeding any type of uh, landscape debris or things from outside, they're likely getting tiny little particles. If you're simply feeding food scraps and newspaper, you may have to um, add some type of grit in with your worms to help them to uh, digest their food through this gizzard. And then, uh, so all these uh, right here, the buccal cavity, pharynx, esophagus, crop, gizzard are all gonna be in about the first third of the worm. And after that, it's nothing but intestine for the last about two thirds of the worm. Um, these are intestines are where the worm's gonna gain nutrients through its uh, cell walls and then excrete things out. So this, these intest the intestine are where uh, all these microbes. So when we talk about um, worm castings being inoculated with beneficial microbes, it's gonna be from the intestine here where there's lots of good bacteria, especially along with protozoa. And so their poop is gonna be passing through there and gets inoculated with all these beneficial microbes and then gets passed out. And that's what makes uh, worm castings so beneficial, especially compared to regular compost. All right, so after that, we've got coming up here. Uh, so again, uh, recap, body wall, very outside, just like we have skin, that would be our body wall. And the coelom, which is the fluid filled part in between the body wall and the alimentary canal. And then the alimentary canal is their main digestive system from mouth to gizzard to anus. All right, so the different systems here, I'm gonna somewhat touch on briefly. I'm not gonna go into super details with all these things, um, especially the vascular system here, but starting with the vascular system. So um, in the vascular system, you've got three main blood vessels. The dorsal vessel, which I'll use my pointer here, is up on the top. That's going to be the largest one, uh, and it's also associated with the gut. So just like um, it's become really popular, people talking about the microbiome and the gut-brain connection uh, in the worm, this is kind of the gut-brain connection. Um, so there's the dorsal vessel. It runs almost the entire length of the worm, along with the two ventral vessels, which uh, down here in the lower right, you'll see the, the name for the ventral vessel, and those are running along each side, along the uh, bottom right and left of the worm. Um, let's see here, was there anything I want to mention with that? Oh, yes. And then you've got, uh, in a worm, they're called five pseudo hearts. So in there, in the anterior part of the worm, so you've got the mouth section up here. I'm using my pointer to, to show you. There's the buccal cavity. Um, and then you've got these dorsal vessels and ventral vesicles, vent, ventral vessels that are connected to uh, five. All worms have five pseudo hearts. So they, this is labeled as hearts, but um, most uh, scientists or biologists, or I can't think of the, uh, the long term for the worm specialists, uh, it's a hard word to say, uh, but they refer to them as pseudo hearts um, because they're not quite like a heart like mammals have, but they are gonna be a valve that's pumping blood through the entire system that goes through the entire part of the worm. Uh, so main thing to remember is that you've got three principal blood, blood vessels, I'm talking too fast, uh, the main one that goes over the dorsal section here or the back of the worm, and then two that go along each side on the front of the worm. 
Then we've got the respiratory system. So in worms, there are few specialized respiratory organs. They don't have lungs like us or other mammals. Um, they, the majority of respiration, respiration is going to be through their skin. So their skin is kept moist by mucus glands that are in the epidermis. And uh, they have a bunch of tiny pores all along their uh, cuticle and epidermis that uh, have a network of small blood vessels. And then they are taking in dissolved oxygen from the surrounding moisture. So we always talk about how worms breathe through their skin. And because of this, it's extremely important to have the material moist. And if you let your worm bins dry out, you're going to be uh, killing your worms eventually because they don't have moisture because they can't breathe. So they're relying on the moisture from their surroundings and there's dissolved oxygen within this moisture that they are uh, taking in through their pores, uh, similar to a fish gill. So a fish swim through fish swim through the water. They've got water that passes through their gills and their gill is pulling dissolved oxygen from the water and passing it into their blood. So same thing happens with a worm. They're pulling uh, dissolved oxygen in through their skin and then it's taken up by the hemoglobin in their blood and then passed throughout their body through, uh, through blood and the syst that system. And then I just showed a picture here of skin with moisture on it because it's hard to uh, find some type of illustration for that. But I wanted to really stress again, the importance of moisture and how moisture is important to worms and that they need it to breathe and obtain oxygen. Then moving on to the nervous system. So uh, with the nervous system, you've got a ventral nerve cord, uh, similar to humans, we've got the nervous system that starts in our brain and runs down throughout our body. Uh, I'll use my pointer here. So you've got it starting up at the um, upper part of the head here, and then it moves down to the uh, ventral part of the nerve, I'm sorry, the worm uh, underneath their guts, and then runs the main length of the worm. So you've got the ventral nerve cord that is their main nerve cord that runs through their body. And then if you'll look closely here underneath uh, four or five and six, you'll see that each segment has three nerve uh, cords that run up there. So um, let me read what I wrote here real quick so I make sure I don't miss anything. Uh, so you've got the three uh nerve tissue uh nerve cords that run through the tissue here uh they're on the interior part of the worm going out through the different layers of skin and ending in the epidermis so um they're also covering all the blood vessels in the worm so we saw the system with all the blood vessels so basically the nervous system is covering the entire body of the worm um, to take in data and information of their surroundings uh, connect, and it's connected to all the blood vessels and basically runs the entire length of the worm and covers it uh, over its entire body is what I'm trying to get at. There's not really any sections that are left out. And then I believe this is the last one, the reproductive system. So we went through worm reproduction uh, a month or two ago. Uh, so this will be kind of a recap of what that is, uh, but it'll show you the parts of what's happening. So again, I think most people know that worms are hermaphrodites, so they've got both male and female reproductive organs. So for the female reproductive organs, that means they have ovaries, which make ova, and the male reproductive organs are the testes, which make sperm. Um, so let's, if you can direct your gaze at the illustration down here, in sections 10 and 11, you'll notice the testes. And uh, if you'll pay close attention to where I'm pointing at, these testes have these dark tubes that go down. So you'll see that it says sperm funnel. The beginning of those tubes are called the sperm funnel. And if you'll follow that tube all the way back, it goes all the way to section 15, which I mentioned before, where you've got the vast deferons and that's coming out to the male reproductive opening in section 15. So in the worm, uh, you've got sections one, two, three, four, five, six, up to nine. 
so the inside the worm, the male reproductive organs come first, but then it goes out. And on the outside, you've actually got the male reproductive opening after the female reproductive or opening. And then with, so uh, let's see, just to cover that all this. So the males, male parts are making uh, sperm that comes out of the testes here. Uh, then they uh, are stored in the uh, sperm funnel here. So this is the sperm funnel. You can see that name, very tips of the sperm funnel. Uh, they stay, sperm stay there until copulation where worms are gonna have uh, intercourse. I don't know if you can call that with worms. Um, and that's when they're ha they have little cilia or hair-like particles that grab the sperm and slowly move it towards the vas deferens here and outside the body. So that's the male part of the reproductive system. And then you've got the ovaries, which are making egg sacs and come out as ova into the ova sac here, where they remain until uh, worms decide to reproduce. And then they are moved out. And you can see that these directly go out to section 14. So uh, female reproductive organs are behind. In, on the insides, they're behind the male reproductive organs. But on the outside, it actually has an opening in front of the male opening. So then uh, because of the setup here, if you've ever seen worms copulate, they come in, uh, go into each other's clitellum. And that what are the, what they're doing is lining up these openings so that uh, one worm can pass sperm into the ovary or the opening female opening of the other worm, and they're each uh, passing sperm to the uh, press, passing sperm out and passing uh, the ova out to the exterior, and then uh, so let's see here. Let's just pretend my fingers are both the worms together, and then you've got the clitellum, which if you uh, tuned into our uh, reproductive Wiggle Wednesday, uh, you'll remember this. Otherwise, go back and watch that, and you'll get the details on this. So uh, my finger is the clitellum. It produces a bunch of mucus. Uh, that mucus starts to harden after they've uh, gone through the act of intercourse. The, this mucus starts to harden. And then just like uh, taking your shirt off over your head, this mucusy layer is hardening and it starts to move over the worm. And as it moves over the worm, just like taking a, a shirt off, it's collecting the ova and sperm and putting it together in the cocoon where they get together, make a baby worm and the cocoon comes off, uh, closes at the ends, makes that lemon shaped cocoon. And so you've got the ova and the sperm in there that are, um, their reproduction is outside of the worm. So that's how that all happens there. And I hope I described that well enough for you. So moving on to Q&A then, let me get back to my main screen here and I'm gonna shut this down if my work computer will respond. Give me one second. I'm clicking comments, but it's just not wanting to come up here. All right, here. So, hey, we got somebody from Croatia even. I think that's a first that I've seen. And uh, South Carolina, hey, everybody. I'm looking for questions. No questions. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Salinas, California. Oh, somebody said that my pointer doesn't work. Uh, so I've been trying to point things out to you with my arrow and I uh, didn't realize it wasn't coming through. Uh, my apologies. Um, hopefully you're able to uh, see things well enough. Uh, still looking for, oh, somebody said, do worms feel pain? Um, that's a good question that I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I will try and find that out for you. Uh, I was trying to do more research on like the nervous system and things like that to see what they feel. Uh, and I was mainly doing research on just like the physical attributes of the parts of the worm. Uh, somebody asked, how do worms find food? Um, that's also a good question. I, I know, I, I don't know how that they are able to seek out food and I will, I will look up the answer to that as well. Uh, I do know that they're going to prefer more wet things. So you'll, you've probably heard me preach about this before, but um, 
you'll notice worms being right at the um, edge of where in a bin where things might be anaerobic uh, to aerobic. So because they, um, when worms are chewing through material, they're not actually gaining their nutrients from like leaf particles or food scraps or things like that. They're actually gaining their nutrients from the microorganisms that are on those things. So that's why they like wetter conditions as well, not only because they breathe through their skin, but these wetter conditions are going to be breeding more bacteria, which is going to be breeding more of their predators that come in and eat them. And these worms are uh, getting their nutrition from the predators like protozoa that are swimming around eating bacteria. Uh, so um, I'm going to look up the answer to that for you, though, on exactly how they're able to find food throughout. And I will get back to you in a future episode on that. Um, so whether organic of leaves or food, the worms are converting food source to nitrogen and microbes. These are the main benefits. Yeah, the, so the main benefits are worm castings are that um, they're mainly uh, through help of microorganisms, bacteria and fungi breaking things down. They're composting things, uh, turning things into humus. And what is very beneficial about worm castings is that they are, uh, I just blanked on the word. Um, as they pass things through their system, they're going to be inoculating their poop with uh, all these good microorganisms as well as uh, growth hormones. So that's one thing that's especially good about worms is that they're able to uh, inoculate their poop with, or their poop is being inoculated with growth hormones on top of beneficial biology. Uh, how, how important is it, is grit when using natural bedding? Um, yeah, so that's what I was saying was if you're using natural bedding like leaves or things from outside, you know, wood chips, uh, things that have soil particles on them. So all these things are going to have tiny little pieces that are going to turn into grit uh, and even sand particles from the soil that are going to help to provide worms with grit. So you're normally not having to add much to provide worms with grit. I actually feel like the people that I see, a lot of people that I see on social media and things like that are not that they're adding too much grit, but they're unnecessarily adding grit that they really don't need to be spending money on. Uh, but yes, I would say through using leaves and other things from out from, you know, your yard or whatever, you're going to help to uh, be putting grit into your bin. Can we injure worms by shoveling and handling them? Um, you're not necessarily going to injure them. All of a sudden I got a bunch of questions rolling in. Um, you're not necessarily going to injure them. They're going to get stressed out well, where uh, they're going to maybe wriggle a bunch and move a bunch where they're trying to escape uh, or they're just going to try and move to they're going to get to a position where they're, they don't feel threatened. Um, so you're not likely to uh, injure them by a shovel unless you know you're really cutting into the worm. Uh, how do you feel about feeding worms biochar made in the garden? Uh, again, that's if, you know, it's super part, small particle size, bio, biochar is going to be beneficial. So uh, biochar is a, people like to call it an apartment complex for microbes or whatever. So if you're getting super tiny particle size of biochar that a worm's able to pass through their system, then uh, you're getting into the getting that biochar inoculated with all that good stuff, just like I was talking about a minute ago with the worm castings. And let me look for other questions here. When a worm's color is pale, is it normal or is the worm sick? So um, based on the reading that I've done, um, the color is going to be based on their insides, which is going to, the color of like the selenic fluid and things like that are going to be based on environmental factors. So uh, climate, environment, uh, temperature, oxygen availability, uh, there's going to be different variables that come into play as far as the coloring of a worm. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're sick. Um, it just means that uh, they may look different from those same types of worms that are in a different environment. Uh, do worms make calcium bioavailable from eggshells? Uh, I don't know the answer if they make calcium bioavailable from eggshells. Um, they have uh, 
as they're, that's one thing I didn't mention is that they have a calciferous gland. Um, and I can't remember which part that is, if it's in the pharynx or uh, it's somewhere between the pharynx and the, and the crop, I believe that they have the uh, calciferous gland. So it's uh, secreting uh, calcium and other things that are going to help to break down their food to digest their food. So worm castings do have higher levels of calcium normally than like regular compost because of the calciferous gland that's excreting calcium into the, the materials that they eat. Uh, some person says, uh, I'm really concerned what if some eggs or worms escape in the ecosystem? Um, I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm not really sure what the question is with that. Um, if they're escaping into a garden or something like that. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure what you're asking. Do you know anything about the jumping worms that invade my garden? Uh, I do know about jumping worms that invade people's garden. I've seen a lot of them when I was in Nashville, I did a lot of landscape work and I would pull wood chips aside in people's front landscaper in their landscape beds and there would be jumping worms all over the place. Um, I would see a good amount of them, but it wasn't like they were out of control or causing that much harm. Um, we actually just listened to a gentleman at the uh, vermiculture conference in October who was talking about the jumping worms. And they're actually uh, considered composting worms because they live in that litter layer and they're breaking things down the same way that red wigglers do. Uh, it's just that they can, um, people generally don't, people generally get scared when they're in their worm bin um, because they're fearful of different worms that are other than the ones that are supposed to be there. Someone says, I'm trying to read the comments and uh, there's words in the way. Someone says, uh, I use crushed eggshells for grit. How much grit should be added? Um, so when I'm adding grit, uh, so I'm mainly feeding my worms pre-composted material where I'm getting materials, composting them ahead of time and then feeding it to them. So, you know, there's wood chips, soil particles, plants that's going to have um, some grit in there anyway, but I'll go down to the creek and get some sand and uh, maybe uh, when I start a new worm bin, I'll add food and then I'll add a small layer of grit. I'm trying to think of how much I add. So my worm bin holds, I think it's 30, 30 gallons. Uh, and I'm putting maybe a half a cup of grit in there. And I don't know the exact science on, you know, if there's a, a prescribed amount that worms need, but um, if you can think of worms and how tiny their mouth openings are, you know, you don't need a ton of grit. Um, especially, you know, think about how their insides and how big their crop and gizzard are going to be. It's not really going to take that much grit per worm. Plus they're going to be eating it and pooping it out. So there's still going to be some grit in the worm castings that they may, they come back and eat through their poop. So they're going to still be getting grit after the fact that they poop it out. Um, how long, how long does it take from the time of mating until the cocoon is off the body? Uh, so they mate and uh, they can stay together. I think it's for up to 24 hours. Um, but it's going to happen soon after, soon after mating where they're splitting up. And then, um, I'm trying to think like if you make a pudding, you know, you think about you mix pudding together and then it slowly solidifies because of the exterior temperature. That's what's happening with the cocoon production is that they're putting out this mucus and then through, um, it coming into contact with the outside and oxygen, it's starting to slowly harden. And, you know, within, I can't say the time period, I don't know exactly, but it's going to be within, you know, 12 or 24 hours that it's formed a cocoon that's hardened and you've got uh, everything inside the cocoon. Um, I think that's about all for the questions. Um, Let's see here. So next week, uh, next Wednesday, Steve should be back. Um, we're going to have kind of a different episode for you. Uh, rather than super educational about worms, we were going to go through the product line of what Urban Worm offers just so that uh, to make everyone aware of everything that uh, 
everything that we sell, not trying to be super salesy, but just mainly making people aware of what's out there that they, they may not know that uh, you can get from Urban Worm. So tune in next Wednesday at 11 Eastern Standard Time for our next Wiggle, Wiggle Wednesday. Uh, other than that, I will sign off. Um, oh yeah, we just put out a Michael Reisel article, a blog post all about Michael Reisel. Uh, so you can check that out at the urbanwormcompany.com. Go to blog posts, uh, or you may have received an email about it if you're signed up for our mailing list. So uh, thanks again, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Have a blessed day, and I'll hopefully see you next week. Thank you.